LinkedIn is a value, for, it, you're giving up your privacy to all of these things, right? I think that LinkedIn is worthwhile, Facebook, not so much, and I'm not a Twitter person, so, well, GitHub, or you could follow me on GitHub, anyway. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about TensorFlow Extended, um, I'm also going to do a bit of TensorFlow Lite, because I know that that's what you're going to do, is this good enough? Uh, it is a bit soft. A bit soft. Yeah, so the back is... Okay, let me just, excuse me, excuse me, let's do it that way. Can people hear me now? Okay. If only if only we had like a, a wireless mic for the actual speakers. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about TensorFlow Extended. And the reason I want to do this is because actual the machine learning stuff you did this morning, and most people long to do the machine learning stuff, the reality is most of your time is not spent doing that thing. It's gathering data. It's making sure it works kind of thing. So... Um, so I'm, as per the introduction, um, I'm Martin Andrews. I'm a Google developer expert, which basically means um, I talk about stuff for Google, but they don't pay me. So um, I also have this Red Dragon AI company with Sam, who's, who was the previous speaker. Um, and we do kind of, uh, we like the conversational AI thing. We like knowledge bases. But also we teach deep learning courses here. Now I'll have a little advert at the end. OK, so what I'm going to talk about is basically machine learning for production and how the machine learning is part of a bigger picture. And then basically how Google has <coughs> Google recognized this ages ago and has come up with this whole framework which they've, they've now released. Now, a lot of people have also experienced this problem, and I'm, I'm one of them. And I built this whole pipeline before it came up, before it was released. So I've got a very painful solution of scripts which do all of this stuff this is the Google way is the better way to do it. But um, so I'll also explain how the components are joined together. Um, but then I'll explain what each of these components do. I've got tons of slides. I'll try and do it quickly. One of the endpoints there is going to be uh, TensorFlow Lite, which is what you're doing in the afternoon. Um, yeah, apologize for the large number of slides. In particular, these come from the Robert Crow talk, which was last weekend on TensorFlow X, and the Google I.O. talk on TF Lite. So how many people were, were essentially here uh, last weekend for AI Day? One, a few. OK. So those people will have seen Robert's talk. Um, hopefully, you will recognize some of the slides, but these are in a very different order. So. OK, so the first thing is basically you've been looking to train a model, and the actual model turns out to be a very small part of the whole thing that you're going to be building, because really you want to make something which takes some kind of client thing and makes a client happy. And in between these two things, there is a machine learning model, but the rest of it is kind of a, a, a whole process. And so this is what TensorFlow Extended is designed to the, eco, it can, the ecosystem around TensorFlow is almost as important as TensorFlow itself. So um, other frameworks could include, say, PyTorch, for instance, or, or the other, like MXNet or, or whatever, CNTK. But the, basically, the entire ecosystem around TensorFlow is what makes TensorFlow kind of um, the, the, the biggest deal. And this thing powers all kinds of alphabet properties um, and customers. So that's that. So here's basically the workflow that one would go through and of all of these things, from taking in examples, da, 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 this is the, the Keras model thing which you've been doing in the morning. And then there's all this other stuff. So this contain, contains lots of components, these boxes. And basically, well, what I want, okay, so I'm going to explain how this is all put together, then I'll explain what the boxes do. So what is one of these components? Basically, it's a little block of code. I'm looking at this model validator component. It's got a thing which actually does the thing. But surrounding that is something which says, well, when, do, when have I got the inputs I need? And then what do I do with the stuff when I'm, when I'm done? So this is basically a little component. We can now slot these all together. And so what we'll do is we'll take a configured component. We'll have put it on this kind of metadata store, which is going to store all of the inputs and outputs so they can kind of fish in and deliver off their results. And then having done that, we can then put in one component into this stuff. It does its thing. It then goes on to the next component. OK, so what's in this metadata store? Well, we're going to take um, various definitions of what these things are. Um, we're going to then execute the stuff. But because they all um, link together, 
this metadata store is going to store who told what to whom for every run of our model, which is kind of important if you want to understand why did my model go wrong or what, did, what happened last time when I got a great model kind of thing. Okay. So given this metadata thing, you can also do some other stuff. You can find out what data was trained on. Suppose you, you could have had a whole bunch, you know, customers are giving you data every week. So say you're an e-commerce site, you may take it every day, but say they're giving you a new batch of data, but suddenly there were rogue customers from Russia who suddenly uh, told you a bunch of nonsense data to mess your stats up, right? You want to be able to isolate the bad data and say, okay, you know, I should, I should stop recommending people in Vietnam Russian products, right? I should, or, or suddenly my site wants to be in Russian because the model tells it to. I need to stop that. So what is, let's isolate how everything works. The other thing I might want to do is compare, well, how, what was the model I gave last time? What's the next model? I can do all this kind of comparison and this, this metadata store, because it's storing everything, and this is like one honking big data store, um, you, can, you can do all of these comparisons. Right? And then you can also do things like, well, I want to take the model from last week and then just add the new data on. So I'm not going to do a big retraining. I'm going to do a tiny retraining. Or I'll take the data from the last hour and just enhance it. But still, I've got to keep track of what data does this model know? What has it seen? Suppose I have a lawsuit about one piece of data. I need to know where that data's gone. There's, so this is kind of a bigger picture of what this machine learning model does. People are, you know, in the real world, the lawyers will, you know, will want to know, right? So um, you can do all this kind of reuse. Okay, how do we fit all this together? So how is this stuff orchestrated? Basically, the my guess is that Google have got their own fancy orchestrator. I don't know. They probably have in history. But now they've basically said, OK, people, the orchestration is difficult to do. Let people bring their own thing. And so the two key ones that are doing is this Kubeflow, Kubeflow which is, I think, um, basically Google open sourcing whatever they can without talking about their own infrastructure too much. And also there's Apache Airflow. And basically, these things allow you to wire all the components together um, using this directed acyclic graph. There we go. Um, so I'm going to skip on past that, because now we understand what the components are, how they, do, how they get their results and can record everything, and how this is all wired together. So let's talk about the little boxes. So here's basically, um, this is hooked together through a, you know, Airflow. It could be hooked together by any, any one of these other things. So basically, we're going to have some training and training data over here, and we're going to pass it through example gen, statistics gen, schema gen, this trainer, which is in, in some ways the super focused thing we, we, we love. Then we're going to have some evaluation, some validation, and then pushing to serving. Okay? So this whole thing is like a, a big picture, and I'll explain why you want to do each of these boxes. So for the examples, basically, you may have a CSV of data or some TF records. Basically, you want to be able to consistently split this into test, you know, training, and validation kind of data. Um, but you also want to make it so that if you train it again, the split will always be the same. You, never, you, you don't want it to suddenly move over the validation data and then continue to train a model, because suddenly you're contaminating yourself. So it's kind of important to get this right. Better to build it once and reuse it. Um, statistics gen, what this does is it takes all the data flowing in and just works out you know, bald statistics, like what are the mean things? What are the, the deviations of this stuff? How many did I get? Um, you know, what time of day did I get them? Basically, it's, it's storing like big statistics, which can be very revealing when someone says, OK, well, why did the model go wrong? You'd be like, ah, oh, just a minute, suddenly, um, the taxis are now quoting the prices they charged in pennies, not dollars. Right? So suddenly, my, my statistics have moved. No one told me about the data ingestion change. But actually, in the real world, this is very common. API changes are just not announced. You're just given different data. So having done that, we can now collect the statistics off these things and then kind of do this kind of drill down process. So this is kind of different from it's doing a model, but it's very much like a scikit-learn kind of model of what the data is and allowing you to drill down. It will also do kind of, you may have big streaming data. It can cope with all kinds of 
nasties that the real world will force you to have because when you come to the, the model, you're going to have it very much kind of batched and, and packaged up into a nice training set. This allows you to model you know, much more as the data comes. Okay, next thing is schema gen. So there's a way where the, basically you may be getting, I mean, clearly if you're getting some dollars and cents, that's one thing. But you may be getting dates. Okay, dates are like nasty data type. And it may be that you have a schema of how you want these dates delivered. So they have a component which will actually kind of guess the schema. Um, the first runs of data when you've got kind of pure data, okay, you can guess the schema from that and then use that in the next thing, which is basically validate that the things match the schema. Suppose I might have lots of dates coming in and then suddenly someone starts to pass me in nil or Friday, right? Okay, this does not match the schema. I want alarm bells going off when this happens. Um, so this is... In some ways, you say, well, of course, it's gonna, of course the data is going to match the schema, but maybe not. Maybe um, you may have a field here which has got lots of addresses in, and it may be that you, know, you only have a certain you know, number of factories, and so the addresses can only come from a certain set. New factory comes along online. You need to make sure you have more categories in your input space. You, just things will happen, and, and this is useful to have, because otherwise you get into like an unknown state with your model. Okay, so having, having got, basically, we've got nice validated data coming in, maybe some images. Um, what you may have seen from, say, like an ImageNet model is we're now going to want to transform these models. So basically, images will be RGB um, with, you know, bytes of, of things. Basically, I want to transform this into things which are like zero, you know, between zero and one, three channels. I want to get rid of the alpha channel. I want to do all various things just to clean up the data. So I'm going to want to transform these things, maybe resize, transform these things in a kind of rigorous way. Um, and what tends to happen is that just like in the inception models, which you may have seen, there's an external kind of Keras pre-process image thing you have to call before giving it to the model. In some ways, it's kind, of it's kind of amazing that the pre-processing step isn't in the model in, to begin with. It's kind of a thing you have to remember. And equally, that component's probably been trained. So the problem is you've got this trained component outside your model, i.e. You've you've been, people tend to keep very careful care of their model and their saved everything. But this transformation, if you don't have it, you know, these are special float numbers which you, know, you might be copying out of the paper in order to, to put you into a model. So this is another step where you'd actually have a little piece of TensorFlow code or TensorFlow transformer code. Basically, you can learn it during the process, freeze it off, and it gets remembered as part of the whole model state. Whereas typically these things are kind of, they fall by the wayside and become special artifacts. So having you know, trained this thing with means and you know, quantiles or whatever, you then fix it off. You can then do training and serving just fine. OK, so here, where have we got to? So we basically covered these examples, the stats, schemas, transforms. So now we're training our model. OK, so training the model. We're just going to do the thing, which essentially, I, I guess, this morning, you were shown the prototyping process, that sort of thing. So here's the trainer. We're going to take in all of this stuff. And we're going to come out with some outputs, which, um, well, there's, two, there's several key things. But one of which is we're going to have this thing called a saved model. So this is a TensorFlow land thing in that you can, I mean, a a any, uh, any old framework will be able to save your model. But, you know, uh, TensorFlow is kind of glommed onto this term saying, okay, saved model is a special thing. Saved model isn't just the numbers of the weights. It's how the, the model is wired together. It's like a complete description of the model. So the, tensor the, um, the Keras saved model is a special kind of asset. And that we can then essentially move to another system. We can use it wherever because um, it's completely descriptive of the model. So this is where we can then pass it along to other components. So basically, you can take your module file, um, you, you train this thing, and bas basically you get a, this is a TensorFlow thing, it will give you out a nice saved model. And from this also, you can track your, we're using TensorBoard, you can track how your training's going. Um, you know, all these things which you'll, you'll have seen kind of this morning, all of the stats that you might want to see, the training curves, the 
regularization, all, all this kind of thing. Learning rates, whatever. And you can also then, because we've got the metadata thing, we can actually track it across different trainings and stuff. So having done the training, what do we do on this evaluation and serving side? So the evaluation basically takes, well, here's my examples and my training. I can then pass them through. This will be the trained model. I can then pass through validation or test examples. And I can see, well, how well does my model do? But because we've surrounded it with all this other machinery, we could say, how well does my model do, for examples, in the morning? Or how well does my model do with a new particular customer class? You can actually do all this kind of sub-selection to try and drill down on why your model is doing badly or great. Right? Um, whereas typically, when we're training and prototyping these things, we have a, a validation set, which is, is just the set. right? But when it comes to the, the real world, typically, your things won't go according to plan. And the boss will, uh, bosses will be saying, well, you know, it may be beautiful when you're validating. Your F1 score may be great, but all of my customers are being overcharged if, they're, you know, if it's raining or something. It's like, oh, who knew? Um, I need to drill down into why that might be. Okay. So maybe when it rains, they pile up at the airport. There's all sorts of various things that could be going on, but difficult to tease out at the model level because it's just a bunch of weights. But when you've got the big stats on either end, you can just kind of divide it up. So another thing you might want to do is just to make sure, is my model any good, right? Um, you just to validate that am I going to do something surprising? Because you're also going to want to decide, is my model better than the last model I had? So y you always want to be able to understand, is are my customers going to benefit from, well, so is the business going to benefit from pushing the new model to serving? Um, and there's even components in serving where you might want to A-B test the models in front of real customers to find out which one they like. So there's a bunch of different um, ways in which you could decide, OK, do I want to push this model? And then where do I want to push it? So essentially, now we've gone through this TFX process end to end. I kind of described how the model is just one small part of it. And you know, in, in reality, the production thing is, is tough. Okay. So one, one of the endpoints you might want to push, which is basically if you've got a cloud kind of service or, or you know, even you know, on-prem service, but you want to serve to a REST API, you can give it the saved model to TensorFlow Serving. Um, TensorFlow Serving has been used for years at Google, and it's been you know, millions of, of queries served. Right? It can scale dynamically. Basically, it can say, uh, how much am I being used? Do I need more instances of myself? Um, and also, can, it will, can let you version the model. So basically, models will serve, will stay live as long as they need to, and then be replaced dynamically, which is kind of cool. Um, high performance, it's designed for low latency. In particular, when you've got a GPU kind of server, um, it may be that what well, GPUs love larger batches of stuff, right? And so serving one request at a time is no good. Or it's very inefficient for your GPU. You would love to be able to serve 32 requests at a time. On the other hand, if I make a client wait for 31 other clients to come along before I give them the result, that may be, um, they may be having a bad day, right? So basically, you've got a kind of decision process. How quickly do I have to come back with this? And how many other, one, how many other queries can I group into the same batch? before I start going through the GPU thing. So th this is all handled by TensorFlow Serving. Um, traffic isolation is a cool sounding bullet point. Um, but my guess is it allows you to partition, like, where, who am I serving what piece of or which model to whom. Right? So this is, in particular, um, I currently have a, a recommendation system ongoing. So this is being A, B, it's actually A, B, C, D tested by uh, a publication you would know well here. Um, but basically, they have to give people cookies. And every time the same person comes back, they need to be served from the same model. So you kind of need to be able to, it's not, it's not really A-B testing if everyone gets a mix of all the different models. I want to be able to ensure consistency. And even 
in between versions, I want to be able to ensure consistency. Okay, so this, the idea of this is I will take this path to saved model, which is just some blob of binary information, and I can do a Docker run, and basically this will then allow me to use this to create a serving endpoint with all these nice features. Now clearly there's the config file is going to be tricky, um, but this is a thing which does work um, and has been used a lot. Okay, so another endpoint you might want to do is TensorFlow Lite. So this is something which I think that this afternoon will have a lot of TensorFlow Lite. And so just how this fits in the ecosystem is that you've gone through this TFX or basically you, whatever you've done, you've got a saved model. You could either throw it to the TensorFlow serving thing for API kind of access, or you could convert it to TensorFlow Lite. So TensorFlow Lite, I will just read the words, is a framework for deploying ML on mobile devices and embedded systems. Okay. Now the, the thing is that the, the server Basically, an API server, you can expect to have a bunch of memory, like beautiful network, um, lots of cores, maybe a GPU or TPU or a farm or whatever, right? Mobile devices, not so much, okay? I've got my little mobile device. This is less than $100. It's still got a bunch, of, it's still got some cores, um, but it's got you know, only a couple of gigs of memory that I can't be sure of the network. Um, and also I've got battery concerns. So I've got to be kind of careful with what I run on this. Um, the other thing is that this is not a small use case. There may be only a f there may be server farms, but only a few rest endpoints, whereas two billion of these things exist, and TensorFlow Lite is used in production on huge, huge numbers of them. Um, but that's not surprising, because if you've got the Android suite installed and you've got Google like Translate, all of these things are using kind of TF Lite as a backend. So um, it's, it's, this 2 billion is bound to be quite a big number just because of what Google is using this for. So here are some of the things which it is used for. Um, text, you can kind of classify and predict. You might imagine that this could be used for um, auto text completion, or it could be used for a Gmail auto reply. I'm not sure that's on the device, but there's a bunch of text services you might have. On speech, you could have recognition, text-to-speech, speech-to-text. Images, there's a whole bunch of neat things that people are doing with um, like auto-photoshopping your images on the phone. Um, audio, there's other stuff. Um, I'm not sure about video generation on the phone, though maybe there's, maybe there's a kind of, there are some dance apps where it'll actually do pose estimation on the phone. I guess people may be playing with that um, kind of a nice thing. So this is actually has to happen in real time. There's just no network, there's no server getting in your way. I need to deploy the model right here. So easy to get started. I think this is e should be in quotation marks here, easy. Um, so there are several things. We can just use pre-trained stuff, um, which is also pre-done. And if you're a kind of an, a mobile developer who doesn't really want to be doing all this training thing, there are a bunch of pre-trained models to do some of the, the key things. Um, you can do your own custom model, um, which has its own quirks, because, and as you'll see. And then there are other considerations like performance and optimization. So, in terms of uh, pre-trained stuff, there's the TensorFlow Flow Lite powered ML kit. So these are kind of pre-trained models to download. This is stuff which is available. You can just dial them up. You have a model. It will do something. Um, but it won't be as, as sh super nice as a, pre as a properly trained model to do exactly what you want could be, right? On the other hand, it can be very effective just to piece together blocks of stuff. Um, you can produce magic using pre-trained models too. On the other hand, suppose you're doing, you've got your own saved model, which is your special Keras kind of uh, save model thing. Basically, you're gonna take this TensorFlow model, make it a saved model, then you'll have a TF Lite converter, and then you'll have a TF Lite model. So the, the thing about TF Lite is it's actually TensorFlow, but light, right? So inside your phone, not, on, not only does it do understand some TensorFlow, it understands the TensorFlow that your phone can do. So some of the operations that your TensorFlow graph will do on your GPU, it will have to do in some other kind of weak way on the, the um, 
mobile device. On the other hand, there may be a better way to optimize how to split up the graph onto your mo the ops that your mobile device can do. In particular, there's a thing called NN API, which is an API for special mobile kind of chips that will allow it to do spe some ops really nicely. And so TF Lite understands how to translate between the proper saved model thing and the ops which the phone can do and do that really efficiently. So in order to do that, we're going to have to convert it. Basically, there is a, a, you know, a TensorFlow thing where you just load a TF Lite converter and take it from a saved model. And then you just write it. Okay? So in some, now this is in some kind of typical Google style. This is, it's never this easy, right? But it's like this, fundamentally, this is what you'll be doing. Um, and it may be this easy in the end, but this conservation is sometimes hard. Okay, so this is the slide which they should have said this up front, right? There's, there's kind of limited ops. So some of the funky stuff you might do in Keras is not converted into good ops yet, right? So the TF Lite team is continually trying to build the number of things they can do. For instance, recurrent neural networks with kind of conditional operations, they don't handle that. So maybe they will at some point, but what happens is, you know, TensorFlow itself is like pretty big and they're trying to make it more efficient and smaller all the time, but of course people keep doing new things. On the other hand, TF Lite started with the ideas, let's do like convolutions really well, because that will handle 80% of the use cases, but then every extra use case that comes along, they say, oh, okay, well, maybe we need that. And gradually, you know, TensorFlow is trying to do this, and TF Lite's trying to stop it just becoming the same size, because at the end of the day, if it's one for one the same thing, it's got to be the same, right? So um, there's a, there's a you know, continual tension at the TF Lite level as to how, mu how many of these ops are we going to be able to support essentially more efficiently than TensorFlow would do in the first place. So. Now, another thing you might be concerned about is how fast can these models run? Um, because we do actually have limited CPU, maybe have a GPU, um, maybe have a DSP, because a lot of these things will have some kind of nice thing for sound. They may be a thing which does MP3s really efficiently. Can we now use that for doing some kind of tensor operation? Right? There's stuff in your phone made by the hardware makers which you may be able to repurpose as being nice stuff. But even this, you know, this on a, on a server, you might have a you know, Xeon you know, cores. They're all pretty super. Whereas this one will have, I think this is an eight or 10 core thing. This, I, I went for large numbers, of course. But in, with an ARM chip, basically, there may be some small cores and some big cores and some fast cores. Just because while the thing is just hanging around, maybe looking at Wi-Fi or, or you know, keeping the alarm state updated, it just needs a couple of like tiny cores keeping the thing alive. But as soon as I, and, and watching the fingerprint sensor, right? But as soon as I fingerprint in, then it will wake up more cores. And as soon as I open Minecraft, it's like, oh, we're, you know, we're in for some fun here. It will open up all the cores so it can, can do more. But basically as a power saving feature, these things will kind of, the ships themselves will shut themselves down to like the minimum surface. So. Um, but on, on the other hand, TF Lite has to understand what the layout of the device is and how it can distribute all the ops. So if we look at how these things perform, this is basically, there's a, a network, pre-trained network called MobileNet. It's a standard thing for ImageNet. And doing some kind of inference on a CPU takes with, this is with general, like uh, real TensorFlow takes 83 milliseconds, okay? But by the time you do this with, by quantizing the models, essentially you crunch the models down so that instead of using big floating point numbers, they only use very limited resolution. Now you may lose a bit of, lose a bit of um, F1 score, you may lose some accuracy, but typically you don't lose that much accuracy at all, like half a percent or something. But it's, you know, this thing is now almost twice as fast just by, the model's smaller, it's only doing 8-bit ops. This is much more efficient. Now, if, it, if this thing actually had a, G, a GPU, which is doing OpenGL, well, it's going to, instead of actually using the OpenGL to display things on your mobile screen, it's going to kind of secretly do matrix operations to help the compute. Now we're like five times as fast as the original. <coughs> 
Okay. Now, if you were lucky enough to have an Edge TPU, this is a, a tiny little chip. I didn't bring it with me, but there, there's a lucky like, USB stick version. If you had a Singapore five cent piece, this would be, you could fit like three by three or four by four of these on top of one of these pieces, okay? So these are tiny little chips. I guess um, Google would love these to go into mobile phones, but you know, on the other hand, um, system on chip makers don't necessarily want to have Google's IP in there. Um, Qualcomm, on the other hand, will be making these kind of little tensor-ready um, chips, but basically they have, kind of have to persuade the, um, the designers of models to want to use their ops, because otherwise it's just a piece of dead silicon, right? So there's a kind of a chicken and egg situation that the Qualcomms of this world, or whoever it is, Huawei, making their own chips, I guess, need to persuade the TensorFlow Lite team to to pay attention to their things so the ops get written so that it all gets into the flow. And then suddenly the Huawei phones will be better at these ops. Um, but the Edge TPUs, basically it's a tiny little version of the real server deal. It's a little systolic array doing tiny, I think it's 8-bit ops. But it does these you know, in silicon, it's super efficient. It doesn't have to worry about displaying things on the screen because it's not about that. It's just about matrix multiplies. So this thing is now 42 times faster than CPU. So having like silicon is silicon to do your model is super cool. Um, and maybe you know if Moore's law is grinding to an end so that we're not getting free CPU ramp up like doublings every every year or doublings every two years, um, we're going to have to move into more specialized things where if you understand what people want to do with models, suddenly you've got a nice piece of silicon. Um, to do that thing. So, okay. So I, I mentioned before this is quantization, huge speed up, and it also makes all your models like a quarter the size because a float 32 is four bytes, and an eight. If your bait, if your weights are all eight bits, that's much smaller. So, a uh, rather simple step if you can do it. And so TensorFlow will do this by optimizing for size. This is what we had before, slightly different. And then basically you tell it to optimize in a certain way and it will now go away and quantize. So this it does, even once the model's trained, it just kind of figures out how to quantize this thing after the fact. There's also another way to, um, this is kind of coming soon, actually do the quantization ahead of time and then see how the model trains as it's quantized. Um, and this works, but it's not a super huge uplift. I mean, you know, if, if you're a, an F1 nerd, then you may want that thing, but this thing works pretty well as it stands. Um, so the, the next thing is, well, what happens if you don't have something as powerful as a mobile phone? What about microcontrollers? So, I, you know, a two billion devices sounds like a lot, but microcontrollers is like 150 billion devices. So it may be, you know, my household has like three or four phones, or, you know, basically I'll have some kind of desktop quality CPUs, I have kind of too many computers, but um, basically I've got some desktop style stuff, some phone style stuff, but there'll also be uh, microcontrollers in like everything else. So my stereo will have some microcontroller controlling the display and my fridge and my toaster and all these things will have microcontrollers in. If I were to own a car, there'll be like 30 in a car. Like it's, um, there are a lot of microcontrollers around. So how, what's, what's the issue here? Um, they don't have an operating system, so like strike one. They, they have tens of kilobytes of RAM, right? So just this image would fill, the image on the screen would fill their entire RAM and ROM kind of thing, right? It's, it's crazy how small these things are. Um, on the other hand, can we write a model, right? And so basically your little MCU model will maybe have a couple of layers. Um, if we detect, is there sound in the room? Right, this little thing is all its job is, is there sound? And you might do this with an op amp if you're an electronics guy, but it may be you can do better. Like rustling doesn't count, but breaking glass does count. That would be super, super cool to understand, right? Um, or is there human speech? So this is another thing. So the Google Home devices have this kind of um, big and small thing chip in them that 
the wake word thing is done on a small chip. So the, the wake word is just waiting for some good speech to come along. But when you, when you actually say the, I can't say the word here, but something rather Google, OK, um, it will then light up the bigger chip to actually do the speech capture and all this stuff. Now, um, Google has been in the news, I think, for actually listening into conversations. But if you read what the articles are saying, it's basically if someone inadvertently triggered the device. Um, I'm not sure how careful the Alexa devices are with just recording everything. Um, but we're, pr we're pretty convinced that this thing is pretty much off unless it hears the magic words. So which, anyway, it's yeah. the, one of the issues is so I, I, will, I will often be doing like a hangout with Sam. We were talking about Google and these things <laughs> and these, home, these devices will be go, oh, no, I wonder what Google does. Anyway. Yeah, so anyway, um, it would be better if I, I could actually set my own wake word, but there we go. Um, anyway, so having done these small detections, it's enough to like have the only output of this MCU is, do I want to wake up my big brother who can actually, um, well, my big brother, my bigger C CPU brother who will wake up and actually interpret what's being said. And then basically, may maybe I'm capturing the last few milliseconds because it's going to take him or a while to, to wake up so I can then pass that along to him too. Um, okay, so basically the TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is a new thing. Um, the idea is, you know, you need to be able to make models which are in 20k of, of model. Um, but yes, this is a thing. So here is a, so there's a speech model in 20k. If you watch this thing at the TensorFlow Summit, there's a little board like this and the guy is saying, Yes, yes. Anyway, um, hopefully the LED will light up. But I have to say the, the demo was not that convincing. So, okay. um, there's also an image, apparently there's a coming soon image classifier. But this is, you know, a, a tiny little chip. If you know how big these pins are, you'll see how tiny this MCU is. Um, so that's an interesting kind of new direction. Um, particularly if you're into the hardware thing, this is, could be very relevant. OK, so wrapping up. Um, I talked about TensorFlow Extended, so we've got all of these kind of, um, it's all kind of ready now. It was released over the last six months, I guess. Um, you may have already, if you've been doing this, you'll have probably sellotaped together a version of this thing and then realize, well, it could be done better if we had started better. And that, so if you're just coming to this new, this is a better way to start. And you may not realize why you need to do all these things, but you'll probably need to do all of these things. Um, the orchestration and metadata is a good thing to have. If you don't sort it out first, you'll never get to sort it out. Right? But also these components are not just Google only. The, the Google components are fairly simple p little, little blocks of Python. Um, so you can make your own components, slot in whatever you need along the way. Um, so this is it's designed to be extensible. But basically, they'll give you good stuff out of the box. Um, there's a tensorflow.org TFX page. It has a bunch of stuff on. Um, if you're interested, go there. Um, TensorFlow Lite. Um, we can serve the models on mobile and embedded. Uh, clearly, we want to optimize for speed and size. And this is kind of one of the things which makes the TensorFlow ecosystem much more compelling than like other frameworks. Because not only do we have the model thing, but you have all of this surrounding stuff, including directions to like heavy duty serving and mobile, you know, down to mobile and like smart objects, right? So interested in that, there's a whole TensorFlow Lite thing, um, go there. Okay. So the other thing, so this is now my, my advert section. Um, we have a de uh, deep learning meetup group. So this is a TensorFlow and Deep Learning Singapore on meetup.com. We're currently over 3,900 members. Um, we would love to get to 4,000 members, so please sign up to that and, and come. And when you come, uh, we just had one like last weekend, um, hosted in not this place but the one next door, so that their main Everest uh, meeting room. Um, we typically have, or we try always to have something for beginners, so something where it's like, here's how I made this model work. And it's very, basically we don't want people on stage who don't show code. So I showed a little bit of code, but typically we'd have collab notebooks so that you could go away and have a play. Um, so that would be something for beginners, something from the bleeding edge. So if 
samurai will we will kind of take turns in having a paper which would say well this came out in the last two weeks here's how it works kind of thing because we kind of this is one of the reasons we want to do the group is just to push ourselves to to make stuff and, and to talk about stuff read stuff right and then for the other people who are also pushing themselves we're happy to have lightning talks so we, we've had someone here volunteer to do a lightning talk. Basically, this is a five-minute kind of thing. And there we say, well, I've, I've given far too many slides, but basically a limit of ten slides, right? Five slides would be fine. And if you think about it, five slides for a lightning talk is like, here is my uh, cover page, here is the problem, here is kind of what I wanted to do, here's why it kind of worked, the end, right? So that's your presentation. And we'd be super happy for anyone who's enthusiastic to come up in front. And the reality is that it's quite easy to speak to people because as you've seen, there's no one is heckling you. Everyone well, either wants to learn something or just to be undisturbed while they read on their phone or they're looking forward to the food or something. Okay, so it's, you, you, it's actually much less threatening to be up talking, particularly if you've done something cool. And so we encourage people, if they want to have their first little talk, definitely talk about this. But typically, we also find people have trouble making it into five slides, and the talk grows and grows, and, and now they're a, they're a speaker at a thing, right? So not, not anyone is unhappy with their current company, but if you wanted something on your resume, that would be a thing, right? So. <laughs> Um, we also run deep learning courses here in Singapore. Um, we have a jumpstart course, which is two days long, plus kind of one day online content and there's a project we force people to make things with code you're making things with code here um, this you pay for so I guess that's one one benefit there um, but fortunately we, we've got a thing with IMDA where these are approved for funding so if you're a Singapore citizen or PR you can get from 70% to 100% off which is well if you're a student it's all off right if you're as old as me, it be significant savings, right? So um, Singapore is very good at, at wanting to upskill people, and this is fantastic. Um, beyond that, we also have like advanced computer vision, which does um, more like object detection and segmentation, and or, there's lots of fun stuff beyond the kind of transfer learning stuff and, and, and uh, other vision stuff we do in the Jumpstart. Advanced NLP. If you've heard of models like GPT-2 or BERT, this is where we deal with that. If you're an NLP person, you'll know there's a lot more to it than we can cover in like three hours at, a, at the jump start. We also, there's a, the last one, this self-supervised thing is all to do with all of the data in the world which isn't labeled data, which is like most of the, lab, most of the uh, um, data in the world. For instance, you could have carefully labeled self-driving car data with the labeling of like every car and dustbin and you know, the road and the rain, all these things you could have labeled, and those are extremely good but expensive data sets. Or you could just take the video from taxi drivers driving around the, the city and just learn because they didn't crash. Well, hopefully they didn't crash, right? Um, but that's all unlabeled data, and there's vastly more unlabeled data than there is labeled data. And so this, the, this is a course we haven't yet um, done. Um, but we've got, the, we've got the content, so we need to get that, this approved, and then we'll run this. Or, or think of, think of uh, understanding how cats move, right? You could just get huge amounts of YouTube video on cats and then understand cats. That would be cool if, if you want to have build a cat whatever, or, a, or cooking, or whatever. Um, but unlabeled data is a huge source of stuff. If machines can do a better job with that, that would be fantastic. So that, those are our courses. Definitely it costs money. The money side is handled by SG Innovate. So if you go under their talent thing, basically there's these courses which says Red Dragon on them. Um, we're also, Red Dragon, I'm not sure whether Sam mentioned this, we're also interested in interns. And this is basically if you've got a burning desire to do machine learning, and normally we, we uh, kind of our bar is, is now rising, right? So the for, fortunately we've had some interns who actually went not just went through the process, it's, not, it's more like they worked on their stuff, we helped them along, they published paper at NIPS, okay, or NURIPS. So that worked out quite well, particularly if you're interested in the academic thing, um, 
it's more that more that direction. So we don't want people photocopying or just training a model. We, we want people having, in some sense, for us, it's like cheap labor to experiment, and that's what we want people doing. Okay. So, but this is the thing. Is they, so with not only do we do stochastic gradient descent, which is the thing you do when training a model, but a lot of the Google models are trained using graduate student descent. Basically, you take a whole bunch of graduate students and get them to train different models, and now you've got a good model, right? So it's not, it's not you know, an innovation on our part. It's like, this is what people do. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much indeed. If there are any questions, well, either we talk about them here or it's okay. Thank you.